Hello and welcome to this ICME Global Awards webinar. My name is Matt Stalker and I'm your host for today's presentation. The ICME Global Awards celebrate chemical, process and biochemical engineering excellence and are widely recognised as the world's most prestigious chemical engineering awards. Today we'll be announcing the winner of the new ICME 2020 Process Automation and Digitalization Award sponsored by Aviva. This award recognises the best project, process or product to demonstrate excellence in the application of process automation and or digitalization within the chemical and process industries. But before we introduce our finalists, please welcome our sponsor, Aviva's Vice President Northern Europe, David Bleakley. Hello everybody, I'm delighted to be here today uh, to uh, present at this event and also to have the privilege of uh, uh, awarding the award for uh, process automation and digitalization. We believe at Aviva that uh, 2020 has been a tipping point in the digital transformation journey of many of our clients, in part driven by the global pandemic and the disruption to business as usual has forced a number of the clients and many of the people on this call to think about different ways of operating their assets and of driving their businesses. So we see that this rate of change, the world is going to continue to evolve at pace. Uh, and it's changing the behaviors of our customers, of their of their consumers, of, of their products and applications. And we believe this rate of acceleration is going to continue. And the only way that we can keep pace with this is to continue to innovate. <clears throat> and we see that <clears throat> not just ourselves, but Boston Consulting Group, see that those companies that have uh, um, adapted and have driven uh, digital transformation across their business, have come out on the other side of the curve with these goals in mind, to stabilize their manufacturing and supply chain, to manage their costs, their cash and liquidity, to organize their people better, and so on. So it's all about driving agility and flexibility and using digital technologies to collaborate in different ways, both throughout the research cycle, the the and the operations cycle of, of their assets and the way they interact with their consumers. Uh, seem to have locked up for a moment. Yeah. Can can everybody hear me still? Yes, we can still hear you. My my screen share seems to have locked no, let's try there we, there we go so so apologies for that everybody um so whilst the business environment has changed and, and and the world that we operate in has changed technology is changing at a rapid pace uh, and if you'd spoken to me as an aviva uh salesperson five years ago our strap line would have been that for every physical asset you should have a digital representation, a digital asset of that. And that was largely focused on uh, having a 3D representation of your assets underpinned by a data model with all the engineering information behind it. But now, as we say, the digital twin that this is was this was uh, one of the concepts on has evolved uh, massively. And we see that to an for our customers to enjoy digital resiliency and to drive their businesses more sustainably, we see there are a number of pillars uh, that they're looking to, to focus on. First of all, the connected worker, this has changed. We used to see the connected worker or the remote worker as, as somebody on the plant. Now the definition of connected worker means something very different to us all while we're working from home. We might be on the plant needing to use remote tools, but we also need to work effectively in the office. The digital twin itself has evolved. It, it's no longer just a 3D model. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. 
artificial intelligence has come of age. It is now being widely adopted uh, across uh, across industry uh, for all sorts of different use cases. And we'll touch on a couple of those as well. Cloud has brought huge benefits. Initially, uh, industry was very skeptical, had concerns about cybersecurity and things like that. But now the accessibility uh, for connected workers and, and all of those stranded at home, combined with the scalability and parallel processing power of cloud, has really opened up new avenues to approach digital transformation. Uh, and big data um, remains uh, a huge driver for our customers. Uh, and finally, edge and IoT. Um, as uh, process control uh, and automation and engineers and specialists on this call will know, we've been connecting to things on the shop floor for, for 40 years, 50 years. What edge and IoT brings is low cost. It allows us to expand more cheaply and put sensors, cheap sensors onto things we, we never would consider before. It allows us to bring data from not just on the shop floor, but out from outside the fence to give some more holistic view of, of operations. So in, in Aviva, we look at the digital twin through three lenses. We look at it through a performance lens, an operations lens, and an engineering lens. And by performance, we want customers to be able to agilely balance their supply chains. We want them to be able to operate their assets reliably and safely uh, <clears throat> and manage the process safety and, and uh, reliability of their assets. During the engineering phase, we want to drive excellence in execution and engineering efficiency to drive down cost and schedule of capital projects. And when we move into operations, we want to make real-time data and contextual engineering information available to the workforce and enhance their decision making with technologies such as uh, first principles models and predictive analytics, artificial intelligence. <laughs> So we look at the uh, digital twin, as I say, through three lenses. The physical digital twin, where Aviva's uh, journey started, uh, the operational uh, digital twin, looking at the real-time uh, context of, of the asset, both in terms of uh, real-time data, sensor data, together with up-to-date state and status of, of plant equipment, and the behavioral uh, digital twin, and by the behavioral digital twin, again, we look at that through a number of lenses. The behavioral digital twin might be the process behavior. It might be the supply chain behavior, or it might be the, the equipment maturity and maintenance behavior. And by pulling that information together, it gives everybody a contextual view of the state and status of the asset and its performance. <clears throat> So how do we, uh, just looking at that through an, another lens, pulling the data in from different data sources, abstracting it, visualizing it in different ways. We're layer, layering on the domain expertise of different engineering disciplines, process engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, asset uh, reliability engineers, and serving that up into an environment that everybody can have the one view of the truth. <clears throat> and we're leveraging modeling technology, be it first principles models or artificial intelligence to give guidance and prediction to the human. It's our vision. We want to empower humans and not to um, not to replace humans. Um, we want to magnify what we can achieve. And cloud has its benefits of, of cost of deployment, but as we can see, it also brings benefit to parallel processing and, and more power. <clears throat> So I'm not going to dwell on this slide. This just shows the breadth of offerings that we try to, to contribute to that digital twin and bring them all into that consistent environment. As we say, the digital twin now, from our perspective, now looks at multiple aspects. And that's because when you're working in collaboration on an asset or in a business context, different people need to see the data in different ways, but to collaborate, they need one, one view of the truth that they can share discussions about. So we might need process schematics, P&IDs, <clears throat> P 
PFDs, we might need information from the process simulations. We might need real-time information, operational information about how the plant is performing. Some, some of the engineers will want to understand the energy management context and so on. So what we're doing is we're bringing that together with the, with the spatial context of the 3D environment, 2D environment and real-time information to allow collaborative decision-making about how to operate and maintain and optimize the plant performance. <clears throat> what does this look like in, in some of our clients? Uh, this is at Knox at Panorama Center. Um, it's it's a, 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 the, the true embodiment of the digital twin. Not only are we visualizing and aggregating data that you see here, we are have an end-to-end -end supply chain model across all 16 operating companies in the ad hoc uh, environment uh, and we're doing predictive analytics looking at uh, performance of equipment and, and drilling down from the enterprise level down into finite detail on individual equipment items so it's a true scale uh, enterprise scale digital twin we've been deploying this across a number of in industries and it's great to see the various finalists today share some of our aspirations for, for the industry. Um, and, you know, if you look at all the finalists, uh, they've got similar visions and similar aspirations to achieve for their companies. So just to talk in the power industry, we work with some of the, the biggest power providers to help them uh, optimize their asset performance. In the mining industry, we go from pit to port, understanding their supply chain, together with their maintenance performance, whether they can fulfill that, the, the orders within their supply chain. In the oil and gas industry, we work with some of the biggest uh, engineering construction companies to, to enable them to provide a digital twin to streamline the handover from design into operations and, and the support of their clients. And in the food industry, fine chemicals industry, we allow people to drive uh, manufacturing execution, uh, so that again they can drive optimal performance of their processes and the people and in the uh, in the oil and gas industry refining industry we do, we've the example that we're showing on the screen here I, I pulled this example up um, to highlight the power of, of cloud computing and advanced analytics um, BP is using uh, our supply chain technology coupled with the performance of the cloud to solve math complex mathematical optimizations that used to take over seven hours to converge to resolve those problems in, in three and a half minutes. Now, I leave it to your imaginations to work out the business benefit associated with that. Uh, BP have made statements, but what would you do with an extra seven and a half hours in, in your day? It's, it's one of the critical things that we can provide to our customers is time. And, and that's uh, often unquantifiable. So our experience is taking lessons learned from our customers, working with them in partnership to deliver digital transformation. And, and all our customers uh, work closely with us to try and help us push us forward on that shared vision of, of providing agility and sustainability for their, for their organization. Um, we are a, a global company uh, with over 4,600 uh, employees worldwide. Uh, we spend about 16% of our revenues on R&D, and most of that is focused on next generation digital transformation technology. Some of you may have seen in the news that we're in the process of uh, acquiring OSI Soft. We are very excited about the possibility that brings. Uh, and um, and what that will mean to us and the capabilities we can can extend to our clients by by combining the two companies. I'm not unfortunately at liberty to say any more about that. It's, it's still subject to the regulators and, and, and appropriate legal uh, due diligence, etc. But we hope to conclude that transaction in in the next uh, couple of months and then be engaging with some of our customers to understand how we can support them better as the combined organisation. So with that, I, I thank you for your time. I hope I've not been too quick. Uh, 
rattling through those slides, but I'd really prefer today to, to listen to the, uh, the finalists, understand about the great engineering uh, uh, and, and work that they've been doing. Uh, I, I, would, I would passionately make a plea to, to the members of the ICME to embrace digital technology. It's important for the future of our industry, the societies we serve, I think it's very important to bring new talent into the organization to be delivering engineering te technology and capabilities in a format that is, is friendly to them, to them. So with that, I'm going to draw my uh, presentation to a close and, and hand back to, to Matt to uh, introduce the different uh, finalists. Thank you, David, and a big thank you, of course, to Aviva. So without further ado, here are our finalists. We have Bill Finger, Bioforum, a joint entry from CPFD Software and Thermochem Recovery International, a joint entry from Croda Singapore and IPMA, a joint entry from ExxonMobil and Esso Petroleum Company, GSK, Process Systems Enterprise, and Saudi Aramco. All our finalists have been invited to join us today to give a short presentation on their work. And subject to time, we'll be inviting you to participate in Q&A at the end of each presentation. You can ask your question via the questions box in the GoToWebinar portal. Unfortunately, we don't have representation from the joint Exxon SO entry, but we will be learning more about the remaining seven entries. With that in mind, please welcome our first speaker. From Bill Finger, it's Mark Kelly. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'll just get my screen shared. Okay, hopefully you guys can see that screen now, presentation. Yes, we can, yes. Good. Okay, um, I've never presented this in less than 30 minutes so far, so 10 minutes has been a push, but I'm sure we'll get there. Um, Thankfully, I'm going to. Uh, so, my name is Matt Kelly from Billfinger in the UK, um, and I head up our digital and innovation division um, here in the UK, focused around everything that we're currently doing around digitalization and all the associated topics with that. Um, and hopefully, what I'm going to take you through today is an application where we've we've utilised digitalization technologies to try and really transform our operations. Um, thankfully, I'm going to. Um, emphasise a number of the sentiments that David's already made around the practical implementation of, of digitalisation and where we where we need to focus on this now. So just a couple of scene setting slides first for topics. Digitalisation is obviously a, it is and has been a key topic on everyone's lips for a number of years now and for us at Building we really need to understand what this meant to us. You know we're traditionally a maintenance company involved deeply in operations and process and engineering projects so it was this understanding of right what does it mean and what does it mean to us and what we came to realize very quickly um, especially with the multiple industries we're involved in is that digitalization is it's so generic because it is a unique proposition depending on who you are and where your focus is and what your job role is and what your industry is it means a different thing to you and it means a different thing to to everyone who's involved in it it's the same technologies as a lot of the same principles, but the, the personalization and the customization of digitalization is where we really get the value. There is one thing or two things that are really common though, um, that we always look for in, in digital solutions and digitalization, which are value and learning. You know, we, we need to look as we implement digitalization and as we progress with it, we need to make sure we're doing, we're getting value from it and we're getting learning from that or, or either. Um, but the trap that we can't fall into and that, that we try not to is implementing digitalization for the sake of it. Look at that value case and, and don't just try to implement shiny tools, shiny technologies. So for us, there's two sides um, that we kind of view around digitalization. Um, everybody will be familiar with IT, OT integration. I'm guessing it's, it's a lot of buzzwords around the digitalization piece at the minute. And we take this principle and, and look out look around that and outside of that and how the information technology side or the IT side, it's not just your traditional IT, it's everything we do around 
the digital technologies. Everything we classify as a, a tool, a system, a platform, that all sits in the IT element. It's very easy to look at the computer side of it. It's very easy to say, right, IT, yeah, that's all the, the systems and support, but we've really got to look below that and deeper than that now with digitalization and understand that all of the all of the tools and systems that we're using sit within the IT cloud. Then on the other side, we've got the operational technology. And again, we look away from the systems. When we're talking OT, we're talking construction projects, manufacturing, maintenance operations. You know, we've got to, to view digitalization in a way that we're going to generate value from it. We have to step away from thinking about the technology and focus on the processes, what the guys are actually doing. You know, David said empowering the people. The people are absolutely key on that OT side to bring that together. And if we do do that, and if we get it right, we will absolutely derive value, absolutely. And that's hopefully what I'm gonna to demonstrate to you today with this project. So intelligent maintenance. Um, so as I say, our core business is maintenance, um, maintenance operations, maintenance management, scaffolding, tools, all that kind of work, as well as we do engineering automation projects. We have all of that, but the core for our digitalization focus when we started was the maintenance operations. And we said, okay, what do we want to achieve here? Right. We want to improve the operations. We want to make the maintenance operations better, more efficient, more technology driven. It's a very traditional industry. It's very, there's a lot of very, there's a lot of legacy systems and legacy processes in place. In order to do that, culture was a huge part. You know, the clients, the teams, the people really taking those legacy processes and transforming them in a way that kept them with the same fundamental processes and benefits, but implemented that technology into that. We wanted to use data-driven systems, it's obviously data analytics, um, all of the digital twin piece again that David was talking about, but we need the data from these systems in order to enable that and really understand what we're doing and get a view of what we can do and what's possible there. We wanted to create something we could platform as well. Obviously, we want to be able to expand these systems, you know, as we put, this may be a process focused digitalization implementation, but we need to look to the future and where these systems are going, which led us on to flexibility. You know, whatever we put in, we couldn't be hard and fast around. It does X, Y, Z. It had to be capable of doing ABC as well. We had to be able to, to modify and flex. It's, it's that personalization piece around digitalization. There is no one size fits all. So just quickly talking through the process. So really high level traditional sort of workflow here for maintenance. So we've got ERP systems at the front end where we're generating the work orders, we're generating the work and managing the, um, the site information and asset systems. We get notifications, work orders. There's obviously planning and execution phase. We've then got acceptance and handover. And as I said, analytics of that data. So we took the ERP and said, right, what do we need to do here? Well, a lot of our clients, we have um, multiple ERP systems, so we need to be able to integrate with them. So we needed flexible solutions around that. Notifications, it was key around intelligent management of the notifications, make sure we highlight priorities, we can allow the teams to manage their notifications better. And again, we needed that ability to integrate with different systems that our clients may have in place already. Um, and estimating platforms and tools and standards that they want to use. Planning, live planning tools, absolutely key. You know, being able to manage on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour basis, the resource allocation, the planning um, around maintenance orders is absolutely critical. And then we bring into that the application of um, remote technologies as well. So smart glasses for remote support in the field, reality capture technologies to essentially get you sort of a street view vision of a plant this kind of thing has obviously become a lot more relevant now as well with the um the covid outbreak um, and we're finding those remote technologies really useful then as we get into the execution phase implementation of field-based technology so once once we've got all this information the back-end systems are talking we're using the technologies how do we make it mean something to the guys in the field um, and make sure it's in their hands Integration of acceptance again, so making sure we've got a system in place for acceptance, sign-off, approvals, making sure that all ties in with all of the other systems. 
and then finally reporting and data analytics to make sure we were capturing that information we're utilizing it so um we kind of we pulled a team together from across the business where we had the pockets of sort of excellence within the business so we used our it and digital technologies teams out of germany operational teams and knowledge from the uk norway um, and the netherlands as well so we kind of really pulled on the expertise on how we could put this together the process we went through um process definitions go absolutely hello sorry can you still hear me yes we can still hear you Sorry, I just have a little network blip on my end. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the process, um, mapping that definition and scope, absolutely key. Understanding which digital tools fit to which elements of the process, but start with the process. We didn't start with the tools. It's building that ground up approach of what does the operation currently do? Is that at its most efficient? And then augment that with digital tools and make it more efficient. System design, um, again, a key part of this, lots of interactions between different systems and different platforms. Make sure we're mapping that out and understanding it. Get all the data mapped behind that between ERP systems, estimating systems, really tie all that together. So this is all real sort of back end um, data management, system management, but then the crucial piece, the operational training and the rollout and the integration of that operational knowledge, especially at that first step in the process definition and making sure we've really got that understanding for when the tools hit the field, how are they going to be implemented and how are the guys going to use them on a day-to-day -day basis and making their lives easier, better, with all those benefits of, if we get that in, then the data in the background being used for the further efficiency and enhancing. Quick talk through some of the technologies. So data interface establishment, this is for me, one of the most complicated parts around digitalization, especially where you've got mixed environments, as we find in a lot of process chemical industries um, that have kind of grown and evolved. We have that mixed interfaces, uh, those mixed interfaces, mixed systems. You need to understand that data interface, and that was a key part of this for us. Um, we then looked at the field tools. Uh, now, this is something we, we kind of had in our arsenal um, anyway from our German colleagues around the field based work order management tools, so the mobile applications really understanding um, what the guys in the field need, what's useful to them. Don't overcomplicate the tools, really functional, really practical, step-by-step -step process and, and information-based. Um, as I said, reality and knowledge capture. So um, we used a lot of reality capture technologies. If you, if you think Google Street View, basically applying that same technology to the process. So we can do off-site turnaround planning, we can do off-site maintenance planning, as we are now with most of us remote, we can do remote based site familiarization, remote walk arounds and planning using these models and these tools um, online. Scaffolding was a huge part of this for us. It's a, it's a big part of our business and it is a really heavily manual and paper based process as a traditional um, operation. There were platform, there are platforms in existence that focus on scaffolding, but we needed something that would interface and integrate, as I've said, with all these other systems. So it was low code platforms. It was, can we use digital form solutions? And then data analytics, getting the value from all that. So where we're understanding now the maintenance tools, understanding, okay, these are the biggest cost drivers on the site. Okay. Um, actually, this asset's failing quite regularly. We need to look at maybe some CapEx and project requirements around that. Just pulling together that information, understanding where your biggest problems are, just purely pulled from that maintenance data. Um, it's really, really key and really beneficial to, to us for planning and for the operations. Speaking of benefits, so what did we, what did we get from this project? What were the benefits? Um, there were, obviously, um, the capital benefits, the P&L benefits to this, the, you know, enhancing, putting efficiencies in place, saving on man hours, saving on back office processes. There's a lot there, but for us personally undertaking this project as, as Bill Finger in the UK, there were, there were other kind of maybe less tangible uh, benefits from this. Learning was an absolute key one. A lot of the things around the, the systems, the interfaces, how we really apply digitalization in the real world and we get maintenance engineers and scaffold engineers excited about this kind of stuff and really making them want to use it um, efficiencies as i've said everywhere just getting rid of the paperwork automating some of those back office processes with 
um, estimating and scoping of projects and equipment. People and culture, really key one for us. Two elements to this. Number one, kind of upskilling our own teams and making sure that we're kind of we're developing our teams in the field, but also from from the kind of industry we're working in as well, making making the industry more attractive to the next generation. You know, we're implementing these technologies in what is a, a traditionally legacy environment, and, and we've seen internally with our own teams, the younger engineers we've now got and the younger guys are, are really getting excited about about maintenance and scaffolding solutions because we're applying these technologies to them um, and it's really sort of transforming the view of that side of the business value better visibility of understanding and maintenance um, increased reliability from understanding when assets are going to fail getting a clearer picture on outages better planning all of that information we're pulling from the maintenance again david alluded to it with the with the aviva platforms it's just about getting and understanding that data and being able to use that for better planning. Um, and then, as I said right at the beginning, platform for the future. We're putting these technologies, these principles, this understanding of digital technology in so that as we move forward and the industry and technology as it already is starts to really pick up pace within industry, um, we, can, we can use this as a platform, not just from a technology perspective, but from a culture perspective. And we've got the people, the teams, the clients that really want to embrace digitalization because they're seeing it working at a real practical level um, in the field, which is which for me has always been a bit of the gap around digitalization. And that's it. I think I've just squeezed that into the time, Matt. <laughs> and hopefully that was a reasonable overview. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. So we'll pause for questions. If you have a question for Mark, please type it into the questions box now on GoToWebinar. Uh, I'll give you a moment on that. If you are a Twitter user, we're live tweeting throughout all of our 2020 ICME Global Awards webinars. You can get involved using the hashtag ICME Awards. OK, it doesn't look like we have any questions, so we'll move on. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks, Matt. It's now time to move on to our next finalist, representing BioForum, it's Keith Morris. Okay, hello everybody. Let me just uh, sort out my screen share. Um, I think it's that one, hopefully. Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so my name's Keith Morris. Um, I work for an engineering company called PM Group in the UK, uh, but I'm here today representing another organization called BioForums. Um, and just as some background, uh, BioForums is an international collaboration. Um, they were set up uh, in about 2008, I believe, um, by biomanufacturing organizations to try and define what they needed um, going forward for their manufacturing requirements. And over that time, it's, it's grown until now they have um, about three, uh, nearly three and a half thousand active participants um, working across multiple different uh, streams. And one of the um, projects, which is the one I want to talk about today, was started a couple of years ago um, to solve a problem that's been in certainly in the pharma manufacturing industry for an awful long time. Um, I mean, I go back about 35 years in the in industry and it was a problem I encountered on my very first project. And that's how do you connect two pieces of intelligent equipment easily and quickly? So just a little bit of background for those who aren't in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, the traditional stainless steel approach to pharma was a very good approach. Uh, you had centralized control systems. You had very good visibility of all, all your equipment and your processes. And you could coordinate easily across multiple um, process units and process streams. On the downside, you had to think about the flexibility you needed right on day one. Um, these systems are hard to change, they're validated, they're all uh, nice shiny stainless steel, and potentially if you're going to make a change after you've validated the facility, <clears throat> you're going out there with uh, a hacksaw and a welding torch and a very long downtime while you, you make the physical changes. And 
a little while ago, um, Sunbright Spark came up with the idea of why are we using these uh, stainless steel um, pieces of equipment where we have significant cleaning and sterilization requirements between them. Um, if we actually used some kind of uh, polymer liner in these, we could just take the liner out and throw it away and be ready to go again very, very quickly um, without the uh, energy cost of running the, um, the clean steam and, and CIP systems. So they came about with single use equipment where these units are basically a support frame where you put in um, a single use component such as a bag or a single use bioreactor and connect them together with single use tubing, which is either welded or uses a sterile connector to, to connect these things together um, as you need it. And physically, they have a high degree of flexibility because these are, tend to be smaller scale units. So they're very mobile. So you now have um, an open processing space, um, commonly called a, a ballroom where you can move these pieces of equipment around. And if you're running a different process that needs a different order of the equipment or different scale of equipment, you can quickly move the right pieces in and connect them together and your process can be ready to run. Now, the downside of this approach is that now all these pieces of equipment, um, because they're mobile and, and uh, flexible, they tend to have their own control system. So they, you end up with these islands of automation that don't really talk to each other. But the one thing the pharmaceutical industry is very keen on is getting the data out of the, your equipment to say how the product was manufactured. So you have a major effort in trying to integrate these into a common platform. And this normally um, involves either completely re-engineering the control that's been supplied by, uh, supplied by the vendor into a central uh, DCS or, or PLC SCADA system, or you have to try and work out how to talk to the equipment and what the data interface is and, and how you actually exchange information with it. So not ideal and all the flexibility and uh, visibility that we had from fixed stainless steel equipment has now migrated into flexibility of the equipment, but very inflexible automation requirements. So we started looking at this a couple of years ago and said, how do we make this better? We, we know what a bioreactor is. We know how it works. We know the kind of things that we need to do with it. So what if we actually accept that we have autonomous um, skids? So each skid comes with its own control system. And the manufacturers of this equipment are the best people to understand how to get the best out of their equipment. So they're really the best people to actually create the control strategies and, and control programs for them. But that doesn't help us as uh, an integration project. So what we said is we need some method of actually interacting with these. So we'll have a supervisory control system. But what we're going to do is define a standard set of functions and parameters on each of these pieces of equipment. Because a bioreactor is a bioreactor. There's a limited number of things that you can do with it. Um, so you should be able to sit down and work out what the um, what the control requirements are in macro terms. So for those of you familiar with the ISA 88 standard, we said, well, OK, if we take an ISA 88 approach, we can control these um, these pieces of equipment. We can consider them to be process units and look at how we actually um, drive these process units and how we actually start to break down the control requirements of them. And then we've also got to solve the problem of how do we act to actually easily set up an interface to be able to uh, talk to them. So we said, well, OK, what's out there? The, um, the best data exchange model at the time is, is OPC UA, which allows us to connect disparate bits of equipment and get visibility of what's going on on that equipment um, by connecting to an OPC UA database on the equipment. And if we then enforce this standard set of functions, we know what functions are available on that equipment. So we can start to um, work on the basis that we know how the equipment is now going to work in macro terms, what functions we've got available, like heating, uh, like uh, dissolved oxygen control, the agitator control. Um, and these are the functions we need for most of our processes. And 
because we know the functions, we can define the parameters they need to use, and we can now interact with this equipment in a standard way. So to break this down into more S88 terms, um, well, what we're looking at is uh, if we take the physical and procedural models out of S88, the unit or the equipment controls um, are defined as being a unit. So they contain equipment modules and control modules that actually control the IO and devices on the physical skid. On the procedural side, which is the recipe manufacturing side, we only have predefined phases. So there is no process dependent information in the equipment as supplied. It's the way that we string the phases together and the data that we provide to it that allows us to make a product. But this means now this equipment can be supplied as a standard item. You can buy it as a catalog item um, because everything in it is predefined in terms of how it um, actually works. We're not saying to the manufacturers, you have to run a temperature control in a, a fixed way, only that we want this standard interface and it must contain temperature control. So now we've got a standard system. And when it comes to the qualification of this equipment, we can treat this as a commercial off the shelf unit. So we can have significantly reduced validation requirements. And this is all taking time out of our project uh, design and build time, um, because this is all being done by the equipment manufacturers on a type basis. So they do it once for a type of equipment, and then we can leverage that every time we use it. So we set out and saying, let's try and define this. And uh, we found a fundamental rule that if you ask 10 control engineers, how do you operate a bioreactor, you'll actually get about 15 answers. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, and we've been working on the bioreactor control scheme for uh, about 18 months. And we are now in a position where we think that's pretty good, and we've got very good agreement amongst our end users. Um, the thing that was causing us the most problems is how to define the, uh, the interface to the equipment, and how do we actually get that to work with the minimum of programming. So basically defining a standard is hard, it's very hard. So we thought, well, what if we borrow from other things that are happening in the industry? And um, we had a look around um, about two years ago now and said, well, actually the best development that does what we want is the Namur MTP or module type package um, standard that's being developed. And this is designed to allow, um, allow you to take a piece of equipment um, produce uh, essentially an encoded version of the uh, configuration in that equipment, and then import that into um, another piece of a, a, a control system and automatically create connectivity to an OPC UA data table that's in the equipment. And the only thing that you need to define on that is really the IP address of the equipment as it sits on the network. So this gave us a very easy route into creating our interface, which we then superimpose our set of standard phases um, and data requirements on top of. So we started talking to MT uh, to Namur about the MTP and realized that this was very much um, a standard in development. So we've been trying to assist them and we now have an agreement with uh, Namur that we can uh, feed their team with um, sections of the standard that allow them to accelerate the development. So we've been working on things like the uh, alarm and event management um, and actually commenting on the operational requirements and how we actually run the phases and, and how we do alarm management um, and what the effect of alarms are both within the equipment and in other pieces of equipment that are running in the same process. So fundamentally, we're using MTP as the, how do we actually set up this interface? And our plug and play standard is the, what's the interface gonna do? So we've, we've divided and conquered essentially. So the group um, is a very diverse group. Uh, these are some of the numbers um, I've taken off uh, the Bioforums website recently. As you can see, we've, we've got about 60 people who are collabora collaborating on this um, activity from 28 different companies. And 
it's made well a lot of it is coming from the bio manufacturers but we've also got a uh, good representation from automation system suppliers and from uh, biopharm equipment manufacturers and we also have a, a a few specialists like myself who don't actually work for um, a manufacturer or an end user but are providing technical um, support to resolve some of the issues um, and just to prove the group is real, this was a screenshot from our first uh, proof of concept test that we staged and another one from the second group. Now, this is, as I say, a group of essentially competitors. And my major takeaway from this whole event was that there was no blood on the carpet afterwards. We all worked in an extremely collaborative way and helped each other to sol solve the common problem. Uh, we recently, um, as in last month, had our third um, set of testing, and these were the companies that were involved. Um, and because of the, the times that we are in, this was actually made a little more difficult in that most of these companies actually exist in different countries and in uh, some cases, different continents. So we set up a VPN and we did the whole of the testing um, over a VPN remotely. And the basic principle was that each of the automation system suppliers listed at the top would execute the same bioreactor recipe on three different uh, bioreactors from three different manufacturers. And each of the uh, automation suppliers was able to run exactly the same recipe with the same phase calls, the same data sets on each of the three um, bioreactors. So this was, this was a, a, again, another very successful uh, test. We've identified a few things that need to be addressed within the standard. Um, but we think this is moving forward uh, in a very good way at a very good pace. So just to, to summarize this, this standard is based on the use of predefined functions um, on autonomous equipment. So the uh, intelligence for running the equipment is pushed down into the equipment as far as it will go. We're running with predefined data sets and parameter sets um, over an OPC UA interface with Namur MTP um, creating an interface file that allows us to generate uh, the, the actual interface. Um, importantly, there is no programming required in the creation of that. Now that's quite an important feature because if you're not programming anything, um, your validation effort becomes significantly easier and sufficient, uh, significantly reduced. Um, and just on that point, we did some estimates that we're just going through a validation test on to revalidate the numbers. But um, we recently looked at a typical uh, bioreactor train for a monoclonal antibody line and we are currently estimating that the use of this approach on the original design and build um, effort would take about six months off our uh, automation life cycle in, in getting ready for production. Now that's quite significant. I've spent years being the, uh, the critical task in getting the automation system up and running. And taking six months out of that schedule means that uh, you know, we can blame somebody else for the project being late. And, and it's not our fault anymore. Um, more significantly, there's a potential saving in excess of 3 million euros on the design of the automate or design and build of the automation system. And this is also seen in, in ongoing operational costs where potentially changeover between products is now um, a lot shorter because we haven't got to revalidate all the links to the equipment. Uh, because literally it's, it's plug the equipment in, exchange the data file, create the interface, you're ready to go. So rather than having to spend weeks revalidating all the links, that happens now automatically. So in terms of where we are in progress, we've identified a number of uh, classes of equipment um, that we are currently working through um, to develop these interface uh, requirements. We have a stirred tank class, which includes the bioreactor and, and single use mixers. Um, that is complete and being ready to be published for more general consumption. Um, we have a team working on chromatography uh, units and also on uh, flow through filters. 
Um, we're starting to get interest from other areas as well in, in the approach that we've taken. Uh, the ISPE have a plug and produce group who are looking at uh, a similar kind of requirement in um, fill and finish uh, type equipment. So that's filling machines, tableting, uh, packaging. And we believe there's, there's a lot of synergy there that we can use very similar approaches to the one we've taken here. Um, what else? Well, we've also looked at how we actually interface into things like analytical equipment, and we're we're currently starting some work, not necessarily oh, on the periphery of bioforums at the moment, but uh, we're hoping that this will come in as well, and then looking at how we actually standardise interfaces into um, analytical equipment, so we can uh, hook up our PAT equipment and get uh, the information in in near real time that allows us to control our processes better and potentially do um, near real-time release of product instead of having to wait for a quarantine period. Um, we know uh, from the testing that's being done online or at line or near line that the product is good and, and okay to be shipped. Um, that's, that's really it. It's ongoing work. We think this is a very valuable approach and, and potentially will change the way that um, these systems are put together in the future. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you, Keith. So as Keith says, if you have a question, uh, he's happy to answer it. Please type it into the questions box now. Whilst we wait on that, let me remind you that this is one of a series of ICME Global Awards webinars taking place throughout November. There's plenty more still to come. They're all free to attend and open to all. If you'd like to find out what's still coming up, visit icome.org forward slash global awards. OK, Keith, we don't have any questions, so thank you for your presentation. We'll move okay. on to our next finalist. Next up, representing the joint entry from CPFD Software and Thermochem Recovery International, it's Peter Blazer. All right, well, well, thank you so much, Matt, and uh, looking forward to uh, this opportunity to present to you all. My name is Peter Blazer. I'm with uh, CPFD. This is a joint entry with TRI, and so on the line with me is Dr. Ravi Chandran from TRI. I'm gonna go through the overview presentation and Ravi's gonna join for, for any of the questions. So let's go ahead and get started. So at TRI, they create enabling technology for green renewable fuels and chemicals. It's all part of enabling decarbonization. And at the heart of the process, two, two key distinctives are feedstock flexibility. I'll get into that as we go. Extreme flexibility into the types of feed feedstocks that the process can handle and high carbon conversion, high efficiency. And, and really all this comes together for sustainable economics with a minimal overall environmental impact. And, and can I just say at the beginning that, that this works? Uh, this is not just a concept and bringing a, a, a work in progress. Uh, here's some images of initial uh, fuels and products produced. We see here jet fuel, diesel, other products. And these came out of the, the process demonstration unit uh, made entirely from either woody residuals or MSW, municipal solid waste. So at the heart of the process, uh, they have a two-stage gasification system. And the first stage is uh, on the left here, a steam reformer. On the right is a carbon trim cell. Uh, one of the, the real distinguishing features here, they're both deep bed uh, gasification type units. Uh, deep fluidized beds, but the the high efficiency comes about uh, in part through the indirect heating using pulse uh, combustion heaters. So tail gas later in the process comes in and, and is providing the heat for the process. And uh, here's sort of an example of how this would come together at their integrated biorefinery process demonstration unit in North Carolina. Uh, this in, included all aspects of uh, a full biorefinery, including the feed system, the two fluidized beds, the steam reformer and the carbon trill cell, all the way down to a, a Fisher Trope synthesis unit uh, on the downstream end. And, that, and that's where the, the samples I showed were produced. So how do you get there and how do you take a new idea and scale it to commercial use? 
at the heart of this process is a model, a syngas model, where we take the the unit uh, operating conditions, uh, everything from you know the process conditions and the the geometry, the scale, then the feedstock properties coming in, uh, running municipal solid waste uh, could be very different than running uh, wood chips, for example. Put that into the model, and the idea is to be able to predict things like syngas composition, flow rates, conversion, efficiency, uh, and and all these other pro uh, things that are important when you're when you're engineering the process. And as we dug in, we realized there's really a lot of things needed as part of this model. There are, are, are sub-models related to uh, hydrodynamics, for example. These are fluidized gas particle systems. So you have the gas particle hydrodynamics, the fluidization, the bubbling, the solids distribution, not just the size distribution, but different materials, different compositions, and all the physical and material properties. And at the same time, there's the evolution of it, right? We have the drying, decomposition, devolatilization, the chemical kinetics, whether that's on the solid phase or gas phase, transport phenomena. And so uh, we asked the question of how do we create this model? And, and this is what this entry is obviously about. Um, there's the traditional engineering approach, which was absolutely used, uh, systemic scale up. So this comes from a cold flow where you might find the minimum fluidization, bubbling, bed expansion, entrainment, mixing all these traditional fluidization parameters. And then you'll have the reacting, the hot reacting units uh, and from various scales, starting at a, a feedstock test reformer at uh, two and a half uh, kilograms per hour, um, moving up to process demonstration units. So four dry tons per day to commercial, that could be 500 to several thousand tons per day. But it wasn't just that process, it was augmented through digitalization. Let me get into that here. That's where we come in. Here at CPFD Software, we have a unique expertise, specialty expertise in fluid particle systems, and, and in particular simulations of those systems. Our product, Barracuda Virtual Reactor, models the 3D transient hydrodynamics, the thermal, the heat balance, and the chemical reactions within fluidized systems, be that gas phase or particle level reactions. And it's typically used uh, to assess performance through simulation, you know, determining the root cause of phenomena, not just what's happening, but why. Reducing risk of changes through virtual testing, being able to explore a broad range uh, of the parameter space on the computer. And invariably over my years, what I've seen is a side effect is additional optimization opportunities always come about, they always do. And the end here is a rapid and informed scale up of confidence. But I want to digress for a minute and talk about uh, one of those buzzwords, uh, dis digital transformation. So in this schematic image, I have you know, the various stages. So you have a concept, you have various tests, various scale up and commercial. And digital transformation is not just using simulation or digitalization technology in an existing process. It's part of it but it's not sufficient. So it's not just modeling the end commercial unit. In fact, it's not just modeling different stages along the way, although that's certainly part of it. Digital transformation is when not just the te digital technology is used as part of the process, but the process itself is enabled to change through the use of the digital technology. So the way this worked is that it wasn't a one-way flow of information. Often we'd go at the pilot and commercial scale find something that we didn't understand, go back and reform, refine that syngas model, uh, maybe even creating new experiments as we went. So the whole model is being used, the same model is being used at scales of uh, kilograms to tons, at scales that would fit in my hand to not fit in my house. Uh, to put it another way, here we have the uh, sort of the overall flow uh, of information. So starting at the, the cold flow, the characterization type tests, moving on to uh, the, the feedstock test reformer and process demonstration units of commercial. As you go up in scale or down on the slide, uh, the, the complexity is increasing and, and, and so does the risk. And in, in traditional engineering, um, typically it's a one-way flow of information, not exclusively. So here's an example on the right where we have 
at the, the FTR, the feedstock test reformer uh, level, we have some test data. Uh, the two different process conditions, I won't go into the details, are shown here. And what we see is that test condition two does much better than test condition one in terms of the, the, the molar flow of the CL and hydrogen. Um, it's a log scale because we have different units on there, but you know, looking at not only, let's call it a 30% increase. The simulation, the model, the integrated model shows the same uh, data and, as the data and the same uh, scale up. And then moving that on to the, the process and then the commercial, this is the traditional flow. The distinction here is that the model is fully integrated and validated at each step of the process, and, and that can move up or down. Um, let me show you this. I've been using a lot of uh, hand waving and words. Here's just a few results coming out of uh, Barracuda Virtual Reactor. This is at the process demonstration unit level. What you're seeing there is different views into the exact same model. Uh, there is a fluidized bed of particles that goes across to about this elevation. You can see the heater bundles in here. Uh, I'm not showing all the particles because it would be a little complex to see. Uh, I'm only showing the feed particles that have come in. And so what you see is the evolution of the biomass content, the char. Um, here you see the drying, they come in moist. The moisture has to release before the, the, the rest of the kinetics often take off. And then we see the impact on the gas space species. Everything, hydrogen, I'm showing CO, CO2, and methane here. Uh, there's a more complex model. So this is at the pilot unit. Uh, at the pilot unit, you don't have a lot of uh, scale-up issues, although you do see some uh, asymmetry that was uh, looked at, studied, addressed. Moving to commercial, you have a completely different beast, a much larger unit. So here is, uh, on the right, I'm showing the hydrodynamics bubbling, deep bubbling bed behavior uh, on a commercial scale unit. Uh, commercial simulations were performed at a variety of feedstocks. Uh, one unit processes black liquor, which is a, a byproduct of the pulp and paper industry. Uh, simulations have been done at uh, using forest residuals, biomass, and municipal solid waste. And the most recent scales are at 500, 1,000, and 2,000 dry tons per day. Looking at not just the hydrodynamics of the scale up, but but really even predictive on the on the syn gas composition, the outlet gas composition. So wrapping this up, uh, that's the process we went through. Where are we today? Uh, the, the most recent iteration of this is Project Sierra. This is uh, run by, uh, owned by Fulcrum Bioenergy. Uh, There's a plant just outside of Reno, Nevada. Um, and this one is a, a very sustainable project. It takes municipal solid waste, basically processed trash, um, and makes jet fuel. Uh, it's, it's being commissioned now. Uh, the sustainability is part of the close integration, both upstream and downstream, of, of not just all the technology we're showing here, but the overall project. Close proximity to one of the largest landfills in the United States. And then supply chain logistics, upstream, you know, with waste management, downstream, Marathon Petroleum, a number of airlines, and even the, uh, the U.S. Navy and Air Force uh, for the fuels being produced. And, and maybe I'll just pause there for just a second. As engineers, we get lost in the details, but we're taking trash and making jet fuel. Jet fuel. This is pretty cool. Um, and then lastly, you know, this is an ongoing process, ongoing digital transformation. So this is a snapshot uh, of where we are today, with current iterations of the project. Um, the software and technology are, are continuing to improve. We're now going through testing on um, new technology, taking advantage of the latest uh, NVIDIA uh, capabilities, and we're projecting our next software release next year to have uh, probably about a 300 times speed up since when we uh, first started working together. Um, we're also moving to more of an automation focus. So uh, AI, big data, machine learning, these are all buzz buzzwords, but they're they're coming together and enabled by the speed and they enabled by uh, the partnerships to really move toward real-time process control, uh, not just better understanding the process, but controlling them. And this wouldn't be problem. A part, this wouldn't be possible without our, our global collaboration and partnerships, not just between us and TRI and the customers and the supply chain, but technology partners, uh, Nvidia. Uh, our customers are able to run on AWS, take advantage of the latest uh, computational capability immediately. 
So that's the, the quick overview of our entry. And with that, I'll turn it over to questions. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. So once again, we pause for questions. If you have one, please type it into the questions box. And I'll give you a moment on that. Don't forget the winner of this award will automatically qualify as a finalist for our top prize, the Outstanding Achievement in Chemical and Process Engineering Award. Why not join us for that webinar too later this month? You can register at icomeorg forward slash global awards. So we have our first question. What is the prime value driver, circular economy or digitalization? I would say the circular economy. And so I'm going to open this up. Uh, and if Ravi, if you want to answer any differently, uh, but you know, digitalization is a tool in the process. I know this is a digitalization award and we should be talking about the digitalization aspect, but really that's a tool toward the end goal. You know, enabling, you know, this is I, I can me, right? We're chemical engineers, um, and but the goal is to, to impact society and, and our planet uh, in, a, in a green and sustainable way for our, our future children and future generations. And really that's what this project's about. And I would say that the digitalization is a way to get there faster and more efficiently. Robbie, do you have anything to add or? Yeah, or I, concur with, I concur with you, Peter. Yeah, the main goal is uh, sustainability and circular economy. So we are trying to make essentially it's all driven by climate change events and decarbonization. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just the one question there, so we'll move on. Thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you. It's now time for our next finalist. Uh, this is a joint entry from Croda Singapore and IPMA. Please welcome Joseph Estrada. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'll be taking you through this uh, collaborative project uh, between my company, uh, Croda. It is called Creating Value in Croda through Packaging Line Automation and Upskilling Operators. So uh, my company is Croda. Our purpose is smart science to improve lives. And uh, our partner was the uh, IPMA or IPMA and their buzz line is uh, Industry 4.0 is our good partner. Okay, so uh, the objectives of the, okay, basically Croda is a multinational company with headquarters in UK. Over in Singapore, our main products are alkoxylates and esters. And we fill these products in either liquid form, pastilles, or powders. Okay, so the project, the objectives of our project was uh, to implement two transformations. The first one is the on the equipment side to transform two manual packaging lines for pastille products into world class fully automated systems. So this involved uh, filling, bagging systems, conveyors. Label printers, carton box formers. Uh, then we introduced uh, robotic palletizers and uh, finally the stretch wrap. The second part was more on the social transformation, uh, transforming our packers into knowledge workers you know, who can take on bigger challenges and have greater impact you know, on, the, uh, on productivity. Okay, so over here on the left, uh, you can see the old setup. We have one person 
who was attending to the uh, filling machine. So he was basically manually loading in the bags and then uh, doing the stitching or cartooning and then uh, checking the weight and then move this on to the metal detector. Then finally, another person will do the palletizing. Okay, so over on the right, you will see the new, on top you have, we have the new uh, packaging machine which can uh, operate, uh, can load uh, bags or can load the bags um, uh, automatically and do the filling without an operator to the correct filling weight. Okay, over at the bottom, uh, you will see the uh, two robotic arms that are used now for palletizing uh, the finished products. Okay, so what were the challenges we faced when we made this project? The, we make, uh, we are a special uh, specialty company. So we make uh, a variety of uh, pastel products. So there was a complexity of handling a wide range of pastel products with diverse textures, tackiness, bulk density, and packaging size. Then of course, we had to keep the project expenditures within the budget. Uh, since this was our uh, first time to be uh, doing automation, especially robotics, the application software had to be easy to and user friendly for our uh, operators, for operator control. And at the same time, we introduced a new packaging option for uh, greater customer satisfaction. So previously, we were just using paper bags when we, we introduced these uh, foil bags you know, as a uh, another option for our customers. And uh, finally, the packer displacement, no? the people who were doing the packing, packing uh, packer displacement was never the goal of the automation project. Uh, but we, they had to be ready to adapt to the change you know, from doing the manual work. And then now they, will be, they are doing overseeing, tending, and perhaps in the future, as they acquire more skills, no, they can even maintain automated machines and robots. So how did we apply chemical engineering excellence and uh, process of safety to the project? We have a site project management procedure. And at the same time, we also do uh, hazard studies. No? So we have uh, each stage process hazard identification risk assessment program. Uh, these were both applied to ensure a holistic approach that requirements for process safety management, safety engineering were integrated into the project. Okay, so for example, a project management procedure under project development, we did a hazard study zero, basic, basically considering options for inherent safety under project definition, we did hazard study one, basically the uh, study of uh, chemicals and uh, furthermore study of the design requirements and process safety hazards were identified against uh, process safety management guidelines. During the design evaluation and procurement, we considered hazard two and three, hazard study two and three and uh, the, uh, uh, decided there were no major process safety hazards you know, for the uh, packaging line. During construction and commissioning, we did hazard study four and five, which is basically a checklist you not know, to check if uh, as built condition is as per design intent. And this is where the we reviewed the occupational safety and environmental aspects. You no, know? so. Uh, there were more of the occupationally occupational safety requirements, especially working with uh, robots. Okay, then we did the commissioning, and then finally the project closeout start of operations. So six months after the commissioning, we did the hazard study six, so basically to check if there are any outstanding issues you no know, related to operations, and then. We do a five-yearly review of our processes. It just so happened that 
for this area uh, that uh, en encompasses the automation project. It was its turn to be doing to be scheduled for the five yearly process risk review. So we built this into the uh, process risk, risk review. Okay, so what benefits did we derive and how did we create value? Okay, so what were the benefits we received? For CRODA, we got a boost in productivity by at least 33% of the line. The line is now running 33% faster. We have lesser variability in product weights. Uh, we were especially surprised that the uh, automatic filling works well uh, in spite of uh, the diversity of our products, our product textures. Okay, and then our new packaging option has also been well received by customers. Product workmanship and aesthetics have improved as well. To our partner, IPMA, uh, it is uh, benefits them would be repeat business, long-term business efficiency. We, we now have a strengthened relationship and a good uh, working relationship and of course loyalty. Uh, to our operators, the benefits are the healthier work life with their ergonomic solution to uh, the menial tasks they were doing previously. Uh, the work is now more stimulating for them, requiring analytical and practical learning skills. They, are, they have been upgraded to higher pay grade after upskilling, so they receive uh, enhanced economic benefits. Okay, so the government, uh, if automation were implemented on a wider scale there would be additional income tax and through the good services tax or value added tax which are applied to purchases now which tend to increase when uh, consumers uh, buy more now when they have more disposable incomes okay so this is now uh, one of our uh, operators no so uh, previously he was one of those persons who was standing in front of the manual filling machine so now he is able to uh, control the robots. No? So after upskilling, uh, he has been able to uh, improve his lot. Okay, further on, uh, benefits to wider society. Okay, the automation project, you know, when we reflect upon it, it highlights the importance of learning, you know, that people must evolve in pace with automation. You know? And it is not an easy process, no? and therefore we reflected some more that best practices need to be shared no? because learning for different people uh, takes uh, uh, maybe more difficult. No? So if people were to upskill or reskill, then things like their uh, people's learning capacity, there's learning principles and interpersonal skills, paradigm shifts, and all these have to be considered. And uh, there are some communities no, uh, across countries that have uh, good programs. And so we, we're thinking they should be shared. Okay, the second thing, uh, the highlight, highlight the value of uh, education. No? Okay, so Automation, no, as it progresses, especially if we go into machine learning, no, there is a sort of apprehension no, that it can uh, cause job loss. No? So uh, that's why we reflected the need for these uh, human values, no, such as nobleness, rectitude, preserve human dignity, cause less concern, uh, especially among uh, influential leaders. No? Okay. Okay, going to sustainability, environmental protection, project is aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We use green engineering principles such as uh, non-hazardous packaging. Uh, the machine design is flexible no, so that we did not need to buy additional machines, thus uh, lowering our operating cost. And uh, our packaging inventory is common across uh, several SKUs, so we do not need to keep so many uh, inventory in stock. Another uh, sustainability uh, benefit, we protected the health, safety, well-being of our employees. 
And of course, we provide an ergonomic solution to the menial aspects of the operator's job, opportunity for them to upgrade their skills and free up man hours to set up new processes. And we will derive a further positive environmental results when the upstream pastillation process no, is uh, further optimized no, to run, uh, reduce the runtime by 50%, which will lead to a lesser use of energy and uh, improvements are in progress. Okay, so since this is IKME, we thought about how, how did we advance chemical engineering and IKME's vision. Okay, so uh, we looked at iChemist vision, how were we able to support it? So we harnessed the innovation through automation and we contributed to upscaling strategies that harnessed the fourth industrial revolution, Industry 4.0. The project was led by a team of chemical engineers. Uh, basically, we started with minimal knowledge of uh, uh, robots no, and robotic language. So. Chemical engineers, now they can learn uh, automation. And this team guided, we guided the team to upscale and adapt to a proficient level. And uh, team spirit character showed no, in overcoming technical and often unfamiliar hurdles. Uh, we, of course, promoted the UN Sustainable Development Goals. There were positive impacts on social, economic, environmental issues. No? were achieved in terms of better health, well-being, productivity, and green engineering. And lastly, we were able to provide a platform to progress opportunities, good practice, inequality, diversity, and inclusion. So going back to grow this purpose, smart science to improve lives, uh, basically we applied it and uh, was able to achieve a successful collaborative performance from the team with our partner, which is uh, regardless of our country borders, uh, experience or age of the members within the team. Okay, so thank you. That is my presentation for the packaging line automations. I will take uh, your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph. So we'll pause and give you a moment to type in a question if you have one. And while we wait, if you've been suitably inspired by what you've seen this afternoon and you want to think about submitting your own entry to next year's ICME Global Awards, keep an eye on our website for entry information. We typically open for entries at the start of March every year. So head over to ICME.org forward slash global awards after the webinar and you can find out a little bit more about the awards. Okay, we don't appear to have any questions, so we're going to move on. Thank you very much, Joseph. Our next Thank finalist you. is GSK. So please welcome Tobias Cleaver Ross. Move that out of the way. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Cool. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Tobias. I'm just a platform engineer based at uh, one of the GSK sites based in England, but I'm going to talk you through sort of the journey and everything uh, that we've come to to develop what the batch flow system was, or is, should I say, as it is a live system. Cool, so I'm gonna go into this and give a bit of background as well, so just understand what it's about, uh, go into a bit of the why and the how as well, um, so why we did it, how it was implemented, I'm then gonna go into an actual live view of it, so I'm a big believer of it's actually working, it's live, let's go for it and let's showcase what it actually is. Um, how it then helped us win for patients and for society, and then just any questions at the end as well. Cool, so I guess a bit of background really. So just to start there and a bit of context and understanding, it's a system of interconnected dash dashboards providing a single source of truth. And that kind of part of the sentence is key, and I'll come back to that bit a bit later on. But ultimately it has three main parts of which it's batch flow, inventory management, and then engineering maintenance and spares. And within all of those three, you then have the predictive uh, technology side as well, which I'm gonna come on to. So in total, um, as a whole, what is it really for? So the aim is to deliver critical medicines to patients at the end of our supply chain. 
but also not just that it's also doing to reduce that landfill reduction and the cost of storing great inventory uh, quantities and control conditions which is then impacting our environment as well so that was the overall aim of it so just going to a bit more background so the system itself is in 12 sites across the pharmaceutical supply chain the reason why i say 12 plus is because it's in actually now 14 uh, with two others also uh, looking to implement it um, of which the majority of those are within Europe but then we also have USA, Australia, Japan and Pakistan and they're all interconnected as well so um, some of our operations will do actually production of say bulk tablets here in at the ware sites where I work um, and then we'll actually do the packaging elsewhere in Europe or in uh, Maichi in Japan so um, that's where the interconnected side of it comes from. So again, it's there to provide real-time movement of medicines to those packaging sites and patients. And it's also allowed sites to share raw materials, components by seeing, of it, by seeing availability at sister sites and if required, shift production to accommodate demand in those countries. So why? So I guess a bit more context, I work at a site based in Ware, England, just north of London, which is only a small part of GSK as a whole across the globe. But impact wise is very significant as, as a site we operate both as a global supply and new product introduction site so we are the core site in terms of transferring products to other sites to then manufacture globally so one of my previous roles um was as a, as a shift manager on this site so currently an engineer but was previously a shift manager where i would actually have to update whiteboards with laminated cards of where the batches were um, within our supply chain, what spares we have available and the cost of the inventory stored at any one time. There was a few problems with that, being that it's a very manually intensive task. I would alone probably spend about an average of two hours a day updating the boards with the correct information, which after a few hours then became outdated. I came to realize that also it wasn't just an isolated occurrence, but was happening all over site and consequently all over the company. So, it also depended on multiple departments to attend key daily meetings and update with the relevant information. So bringing me back to that point earlier about the single source of truth, this wasn't the case, but needed to be so. So you would have departments argue about who actually owned the batch. Yes, we do have the correct spares. No, we don't. Yes, our inventory is this value. No, it isn't. It's this value. And trying to understand then what was going to ship that week. Did we have enough spare parts to then fix on the line? Did we have the required maintenance completed? It became an absolute nightmare in trying to logistically manage all of that and was costing around hundreds of hours each week um, that people could use for more productive tasks. So my thought was, why can't we just automate this and provide that single source of truth of data that is near real time? So how do we do it? And I'll actually go on to the lab down a bit later, but we used a combination of Power Apps and Power BI linked with our SAP system to then produce these variety of dashboards, which are then completely automating automated updates. Um, as I said, near real time, some of them are instantaneous, some of them are hourly, depending on the information that we need to receive and how critical that information was. Um, and traditionally, pharma being slow on the uptake of technologies plus being a heavily regulated industry is a challenge to implement these new systems or strategies as well so changing that system which people would have been used to for years would also take effort so from that using those three systems the batch flow system was then born which provides a visualization of batch flow cycle time inventory at risk stock engineering maintenance and spares in an integrated functional system all aligned to the common goal of improving our flow of batches through the supply chain, so far providing over 13 million pounds in savings of environmental and business costs. And more importantly, it's allowed us to deliver our critical medicines more sustainably and reliably to the patients at the end of our supply chain. And actually you can then kind of see from the previous photo where it was a manual board, which was on that wall there, we've now replaced it with a fully digital touchscreen that they can actually interact and integrate with that tracker as well. So I'm gonna go into a live view because I'm a big believer of actually just showing you uh, what it's like. But again, just a bit of a disclaimer there. So we have modified our batch information just to for patient safety. Um, but in terms of physically where batches are, that might be uh, true to an extent. So can you all see my screen? Hopefully you can. Yes, can. Um, yep. So just before, so just to give it a bit of a layout, this is one of our oral solid dose ones uh, within Power BI. 
we actually have all of the others here from all the different sites and they also have them kept in their own workspaces as well depending on the site um, but ultimately this gives us a complete overview of exactly where our batches are within the supply chain what part of the end-to-end -end, uh, manufacturing process they're in where the shipping is what our cycle time is and any issues that occur you can then actually interact with the cards but if i view in you can see based on color coding is it shipping this week is it shipping next week and then how long it's been within the supply chain in terms of days but then also based on the product it color changes based on predictive a predictive model so it knows actually this uh, batch here is going to be on time even though it's sat in the red lane if based on the data it's been given and based off previous batches of that product going through it will then be on time this one however we know is not going to be uh, on time and we need to do something about it so that then provides that corrective action if i then as i then clicked on it it's then updated the top just to filter out what the problem is um, and then also show exactly how many days it's spent in each of the areas and then how long it's spent in that usage decision section so it allows us to see in real time exactly where our batches are exactly what our cycle time is every single day and where the inventory is then stored as well and easily identify the bottlenecks moving through a slightly different modification here looking at one of the respiratory ones it also lets us see the inventory in between each one how long it's been sat there since it was released from the previous unit operation and then how long um, the batches have been sat there in terms of their work in progress cycle time and how they're progressing through as well and then also any comments and data again that is then visible so from that as i said you can then see cycle time so we can then see from here that um, you can see a sort of summary of how things are moving within the chain if it's over if it's under um, and then how it's progressing where our quantities are in terms of our red lane um, and where the inventory bottlenecks then are, what's been packed here today, and what's our cycle time sort of as a rolling last seven days. And that's also then trended on other screens as well. From that, again, going back to the oral solid dose one, we can see actually just how that's impacted. So starting in January from 50 days, or shall I say from quarter two, we can see actually how we're reducing. We've gone from 41 to 32 days over the quarters by using this tool as assisted technique. As I said, that's all sort of the batch flow side of it. So the inventory side of it, it gives us again, a quick snapshot. We can go into detail of any expiring stock, expired stock as well, um, which the other batch flow system covers. Um, but again, it gives us a quick snapshot. Where's our inventory for a site? Are we red and green? And then for each of the areas, how we're doing as well, and each of the value streams in particular. And going back to this point here with the batch tracker here, it also allows us to prevent any write-offs of stock. So one of our biggest issues we had was stock then expiring as it then shows the release date as well as the expiry date. So we know actually if we don't use it before that date, we then have to throw it to landfill or incinerate it, which then affects our environment. We're then prioritizing those batches now and a first in first out methodology. And then moving on to the maintenance and spares side. So this allows us to have a real time update of how our maintenance schedule for the week's progressing, what outstanding routines we have left, the criticality of them. And then that automatically then gets assigned to a different uh, engineering technician. So then we know actually, do we have the sufficient resource this week to complete it? And then hand that back to manufacturing on time. And there's also a spare section as well, looking at in a bit more detail, what spares have we got, the availability, um, and actually, yes, we've got zero. Has that been reordered? Has it not? Then we need to make sure we have that spare in stock to then make sure it doesn't um, cause any downtime of not having any spares. And I guess as an engineer, reducing inefficiencies and leaning out processes is in the heart of what we do. So all of these three then combined has, as I said, helped reduce our cycle time inventory and efficiencies on site. So moving back to the PowerPoint presentation. So how has this helped us win for patients in society? So it's provided a cost of waste reduction. We're no longer now throwing away batches due to them having been expired and sending that to landfill or uh, incinerating them, impacting our environments. We're now making sure they get used throughout every part of the supply chain and no batch gets missed now. So we used to have a three million pound uh, on average uh, cost of waste sort of value. That's now gone to just under 100,000 pounds um, monthly. So not completely eliminated it, but has significantly reduced it. We then have a cost of storage material. So we have to store that in controlled conditions. We use chillers. We have to then use um, a variety of HVAC systems. We've actually then been able to downsize how we store our material because our reduction in cycle time, cycle time has become more sustainable. We then don't need to store as much inventory within the supply chain itself. Um, we can actually reduce that in terms of what's being stored, therefore reducing our environmental impacts as well of storing it in those controlled conditions. 
one of the most important parts here and really hits home is that increased delivery of medicines to patients. So yes, in Aichi, you can see when we've shipped batches rather than waiting for an email from our planning department and it being very manually based, they can automatically see it's incoming into their batch tracker. Then they can then ship that across and straight away it's reduced that cycle time to be more sustainable as well, guaranteeing um, on time in full to our patients. It's development of digital skills within the industry. So what we did was having replaced that manual system and then now being fully integrated across 14 sites within the GSK network who are all using this tool. Um, what it's then done is actually teach them how to use Power BI without them realizing they're using it. So it's actually developed those skills of other engineers and um, also other uh, members of staff and production quality technical um, to then use this as a tool um, in their day-to-day -day lives. But then also then actually, and I know how Power BI works, I'm gonna go and create my own. So it's actually giving them and those skills to then use in elsewhere as well to then remove any, remove any wasteful processes. And one of the key things there is data accessible to all. So using our SAP system and pulling the data from that, I then didn't hide away the data that goes into the batch tracker. I've then made that accessible to all in an easily linked format. So that's then why it's expanded to two more sites and then also two more on the way. Uh, from that is because they've just taken the data and then been able to modify the template for their site and hopefully then get the same benefit that we have here at WARE and across the other 13 sites. So thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. So we'll pause once again, and if you have a question, please type it in now into the questions box. And while we give you a moment on that, now is a good time to thank our volunteer judging panel led by head judge Keith Batchelor. The judges work tirelessly to review and score every entry, and you can find out more about their work and the judging panel themselves on the ITV Global Awards web pages. Okay, we don't appear to have any questions, so we're going to move on. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is representing the entry from Process Systems Enterprise. Please welcome Steve Hall. Hi Steve, we can see your screen, we can't hear you. You will just need to unmute your microphone. Okay, Steve, we still can't hear you. Uh, if you're having difficulties, it's worth checking the audio tab on yeah. the go can, to Can you hear me portal. now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just trying to figure out. My my great apologies. Uh, okay, uh, sorry about that, everybody. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen and hear me. Uh, firstly, yeah. thanks, Matt, for organising and for comparing, and thank you to IKME for the opportunity to speak to, to, to you all and uh, for all of the good work that's done in the awards and, and everything else. Um, so um, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about the uh, GPROMS digital applications platform, which is our entry for uh, this year's awards. Firstly, uh, to apologize on behalf of my colleague, Mark Matsopoulos, who, who couldn't join us today. Um, so, Without further ado, I just give you a very brief um, background to, to Process Systems Enterprise. So we're based in London. We're a spin-out company from Imperial College, um, and uh, we're all about doing process modelling and uh, simulation. So we have our tool is called GProms. Uh, that's our main modelling tool, process modelling tool, and we use that for this equation base. We use it for uh, steady-state modelling, dynamic simulation and optimization and uh, at the moment uh, around PSE has offices all around the world uh, about 230 people 
Um, there's a picture of GProms uh, and the process modeling tool that we have. And uh, as I said, our mission is very much uh, about trying, uh, innovating within modeling technology um, and uh, methodologies and workflows. Uh, in uh, late last year, we were purchased by Siemens as well. So now we're part of the Siemens uh, organization. Um, I just show very quickly the GProms because uh, our, um, our entry is all about trying to turn models and put models online. Uh, and uh, as I said, in PSC, we're very much focused on uh, our system called GProms. It's process and materials modeling. And uh, this is kind of equation based. We have really two areas, one in what we call in process and then what we call in, in formulated products. So we're working across quite a wide range of industries from things like um, oil field optimization, power plants, uh, petrochemicals, through to uh, API manufacturing, for example, in pharmaceuticals and food and beverage and things like that. So we're covering quite a large range. And uh, what we are doing and our entry is about our digital applications platform. The idea is that the models that we build or our customers build within GProms itself is how do you try to get the value for those and uh, be able to use those online. Um, and traditionally, certainly within PSC and I think in, in other tools and in other industries, that's not always been so easy because of issues to do with getting the data and cleaning data up and having things running reliably and continually. So the, the deep, GProms digital application platform is really designed to be able to uh, take the model, connect it up to plant systems, and then be able to use that same model to do things like monitoring, uh, optimize a process or forecast its, its future performance. The, the, the reason why as well, I, th I think people on the line will, will appreciate that, you know, when you build a model, if, if, if any of you have had to build a model in any other tools, you know, like Aspen, Hysis or whatever, and, and, or hopefully GProms, but uh, the, um, you know, there's a lot of knowledge goes into those models and a lot of um, work goes into tuning them and making sure that they, you know, maybe reflect the kinetics of the process or the heat transfer in the process itself. So it, it makes a lot of sense. If you can take that same model and put it online, then you continue to use the benefits of all of the knowledge that you put into the model to start with. So the platform itself is uh, a general software platform, as I say, for building, testing, deploying, troubleshooting, um, robust, resilient, efficient digital applications. Um, what it is, is um, it's a sort of software system. So we, we can see this sort of box here and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in, in a minute. But the idea is that um, you can see on the bottom right, if I just try and get the pen here, uh, sorry, I'll get the laser pointer. We have our uh, plant model here that we will have developed in our uh, simulation tool, in this case in GProms. And um, we have um, the, the, the application platform here. What that's doing is that's connecting to various data servers. So um, at the start of this session, David talked about uh, Aviva purchasing OSI Pi, so that would be one data historian, for example, or um, it could be, um, I think Keith was mentioning about uh, OPC UA, so it could be connecting to, to those types of things. Um, and then we are configuring the tool. So this within the blue box here is a standard tool. It's kind of, uh, most of it remains the same no matter what the application is. So all those different range of applications I, I was talking about earlier on, this would be mainly the same. Um, but we would uh, have some configuration information there to, to configure the system for a particular uh, application. And uh, looking inside the box here, we have, uh, again, various elements of this. So we have something to uh, manage the communication with the um, the data historians or the uh, DCS or whatever. We have uh, elements here to do things like data validation. So when I take the data from the plant, 
to make sure that uh, that data is good enough to be passed to the model. We'll do things like uh, check, you know, against limits or rate of change or whatever. And then we pass it to these, we call these computational modules. So these basically are wrappers for the plant model. They call the plant model, run it, get the results back. And then uh, we have some kind of validation of the results before it's pushed back to the external data server. So this could be, for example, um, an ethylene plant. We've done quite a lot of work on uh, uh, cracking furnaces in ethylene plants. So you could be running a model to predict the yield, for example, um, and that could be then pushed back to uh, back to the DCS. So this kind of gives a, an idea of the uh, the platform itself. Um, and uh, again, we're using this in 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 lots of different areas now. So again, the you can see most of it kind of stays the same, but these computational modules change. So we have things like we can do a long-term equipment monitoring forecasting. We can do things like soft sensing. So we can, um, you know, calculate those difficult to measure or impossible to measure things like catalyst deactivation and things, uh, real-time optimization, um, and then also things like control, especially nonlinear model predictive control. Um, in terms of the workflow as well, um, the workflow we believe is, again, we're, we're op trying to optimize the workflow. So how we actually deploy this digital applications platform. So we start off with our model and then we have, uh, we configure that model for the particular uh, process itself. Um, the, this actually, this, the studio, can actually read a lot of the configuration information directly from the model itself. So there's a very sort of automatic process here to, uh, to, to generate the sort of configuration that you need to run it online. Um, one thing that you do need to do more manually is connect it to, uh, you know, to decide what, for example, if the model needs a temperature, let's say as an input, where is that temperature in the DCS or in the the data historian so what's the tag id things like that and then we uh, deploy this uh, and uh, operate it uh, online and finally uh, troubleshooting it and uh, commissioning it and, and, and getting it running so the, the, these are the kind of the deployment steps uh, so you can see starting kind of in an offline way and then moving to the to the online um, just to give you some ideas we've deployed this in, in lots of different areas like i say it's very generic for, for for models so things like ethylene furnaces i mentioned utilities reactors we've done uh, polymerization reactors as well as fixed bed reactors and uh, things like production optimization in oil fields as well um, i'll just show you quickly an example uh, which is for equipment monitoring forecast and optimization and it's uh, Going back to the ethylene plant, this is actually uh, a acetylene converter. Uh, in the acetylene converter, you're trying to hydrogenate acetylene to ethylene. Unfortunately, you have various side reactions where you uh, hydrogenate ethylene to ethane, for example, which is highly undesirable. So the idea is try to have a model where you can maximize the desired reaction and minimize the, the undesired reactions. So we build our model first in GPROM. So we can see here, we've got a reactor with, with two reactor beds and uh, we can do a very detailed um, um, model of that. And, and, and this comes back to, you know, in this case and, and whatever simulator you're using, um, you know, there's a lot of knowledge goes into building up the model. So the idea is if you can use the same model that you've done, maybe maybe R and D, maybe design. If you can put that online, then of course you maintain your kind of use of 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 that knowledge. So we build our model in GPROMS for the reactor, and you can see here this kind of shows how the the system looks. So we would have our digital applications platform here, and we have our various computational mod modules which are calling our GPROMS models. So we do like a parameter or a state estimation here. So with that, we'll be looking at things like uh, catalyst deactivation. 
we'll then do things like forecasting. So this might be trying to predict when the catalyst needs to be changed and the future uh, deactivation properties, and then trying to optimize. So it could be in this case, hydrogen flows or reactor temperatures. Here's, we uh, have our reactor model here, which is used by the platform itself. And uh, this shows uh, there's a dashboard was put online with this system. Um, and uh, this is actually running in, in open loop. So this is where the, the, the data is put out to a database, which is read by this dashboard. And it shows easily for the operator here. You can see the estimated column is the current reconciled values within the plant itself. And uh, here we have optimized uh, values. So the operator knows just to look at this column here and knows that um, if they implement these, these, these conditions, then they can expect to get, here we see the overall ethylene gain. So we expect to get an increase in ethylene gain for this particular reactor. Uh, just to look at things like on the soft sensing side, you can see that here we have things like, uh, again, we having with a model, we can calculate lots of nice details within the reactor bed as well. So we can look at things like temperature profiles, settling concentrations, hydrogen concentrations, things like that. So it gives a lot of insight when it's running this as well. And again, it's getting the real value of the model that was developed, maybe using laboratory data, maybe maybe a few years back. Okay, uh, so just to conclude there, um, you know, our, our entry is, is our digital applications platform. Uh, it's a general platform uh, using to, to basically put models online. So building, testing, deploying um, models and embedding them into this digital application. Um, it's generally used for these types of things, monitoring, forecasting, optimization. And uh, also we can build in what if capabilities there with that uh, for operations, engineering, maintenance people. Um, and uh, we can add on dashboards there, which give lots of good information for operators. And uh, it's uh, because things are saved into a dash into a database, sorry, there as well, then you've got that information available to other tools as well. Um, that might want might might want access to that information. Okay, th thanks a lot for your attention, and again, thanks to uh, uh, the organisers for for the opportunity to participate and present. Okay, thank you, Steve. So once again, we'll pause for questions. If you have a question, please type it into the chat uh, the question box on GoToWebinar. Uh, so we have a couple in already. Um, which part of the workflow do you consider most critical and why? <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, usually the most, the, there are two parts of the workflow which I think are, are critical. Um, if I can use two rather than one. Uh, the first one is to make sure that the model um, is, is built so that it, uh, can be integrated into a digital application efficiently. What I mean by that is that, um, you know, uh, if, if you're measuring a temperature and you're measuring a flow rate, then your model has to be built recognizing that it will receive that te a temperature and a flow rate. So I think it, it's easier in, in, in say, GPROM system where you, you've got like equation oriented, so it's not so important. But generally speaking, if you were to do this, you know, um, in, in these types of uh, approaches, then making sure that the model matches. The other, the other part is, is, is kind of related, but it's the data because, you know, the data is always often is difficult i would say i think most projects actually there's an element of data complexity the data maybe isn't correct even isn't all there uh, so how do you do that so how do you um the, the 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 difficult thing is is putting like limits say on on what the data should be and deciding how best to deal with it if the data for example is outside the limits so I think those are the two areas I would say is making sure the model 
is appropriate for a digital application and um, secondly yeah the data it, the configuring the data and the way the data is read into the system Okay, thank you. How would the proprietary license agreements be accommodated? For example, some polypropylene startup models by equipment manufacturers limit who may access the data to prevent back engineering of startup dynamics. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, <laughs> we do come up against this occasionally, actually. Um, the uh, often, uh, so there are two situations that I've, that I've been involved with. One is where um, we actually worked with the licensor themselves. And uh, so we were able to, um, you know, work, work with that licensor to, um, we, we actually as a company work with lots of the, for example, catalyst manufacturers. Um, so we have worked on polymerization side with one licensor. Um, the the on on the other side not not on polymerization but i've done it with uh, another fixed bed reactors where the customer basically had to uh, engage the supplier of the catalyst to basically to to allow us to to put a model on on the system and uh, there were certain sort of requirements placed on us to ensure that we didn't do that kind of uh, you know back engineering thing Okay, thank you very much. We're out of time for questions, so thank you, Steve. We Thanks, now move to our final presentation, and this is a pre-recorded presentation from Saudi Aramco. Greetings, and this short video will share with you an overview of Saudi Aramco's fourth industrial revolution center highlighting its major aspects and components. Saudi Aramco is a performance-driven company and the center plays a vital role in driving excellence, delivering on corporate KPIs, and creating value to our stakeholders. This is achieved through focusing on long-lasting sustainability, not only for better environment and more energy efficient operations, but also developing digital solutions that will help optimize the company's capital and operating costs. We also focus on our customer value by ensuring that Saudi Aramco is the most reliable supplier of the highest quality products in the market. Powered by our young and talented people, the center plays a major role as the corporate digital think tank that provides a collaborative space to explore and discover new opportunities and innovative ways of using 4IR and digital transformation technologies. Over the next few minutes, we'll share with you more background on the three main hubs of the 4IR Center, the artificial intelligence, UAV and robotics, and 3D printing. Welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Hub. The AI Hub receives more than 5 billion data points every day from our operations across the kingdom. This is in addition to availing millions of engineering drawings, millions of inspection, and maintenance data, all forming what we call operational big data. Now, utilizing the IT infrastructure behind the center, as well as the use of AI and machine learning tools, we are able to transform those big data into a meaningful insights that enhance and predict our performance toward achieving our corporate commitments, KPI, and ultimately increase the value to our stakeholders. To ensure that Saudi Aramco remains a reliable supplier of oil and gas, we have developed several AI solutions that monitors the quality of our products, part of which is the crude quality solution. The crude quality solutions predict the quality issues of all our produced crude grades. To achieve this, we have built a machine learning model that predicts the water in oil and accordingly sustain our product quality. Another developed solution is the NGL recovery optimization solution, which is a cutting edge prescriptive solution that uses a combination of physics-based modeling, machine learning, and mathematical optimization to advise our central planner's team to manage this vast network of NGL 
in real time. In the area of sustainability, we have developed several AI solutions, part of which is the flare monitoring solution. The flare monitoring solution is a predictive solution that allows us to monitor and diagnose the flaring root causes with the aim of achieving our environmental compliance. Realizing our commitment towards the environment, we have developed the emission monitoring solution that monitors the greenhouse gas emissions from 2,000 sources across around 160 operating facilities. This helps us benchmark each operating facilities and identify reduction opportunities. One of the main pillars of the Saudi Aramco Fourth Industrial Revolution Center is the 3D printing corner, which covers three main objectives. The first objective is to work with innovators and inventors to transform their ideas into sketches, then to a 3D mechanical design, and finally into a prototype using 3D printing. An example is the new 3D printed mask that was designed and printed in the 4IRC. This design was further enhanced utilizing our computational fluid dynamics capabilities to further enhance its efficiency. The second objective is turning non-critical plant parts from a metallic to a non-metallic material. In that area, a sight glass in one of the critical plant's equipment had to be replaced, and instead of ordering similar part, the sight glass was 3D printed and installed in the facility saving significant time and effort. Finally, we work on digitizing spare parts from physical to a digital design, which makes it so much easier in the future for inventory management. Expanding further in the UAV and robotics, Saudi Aramco has deployed technologies covering air, ground, and subsea robotics. In air, we have deployed more than 40 UAVs that support us in emergency response, aerial mapping inspection services, projects progress monitoring, as well as environmental protection. We have as well deployed two main platforms for ground robots supporting us in remote facilities operations and in firefighting in case of an emergency. We have also deployed three main platforms for industrial submarines that supports us in monitoring our subsea assets and conducting our in-tank inspection. Okay, so that was a pre-recorded presentation by Saudi Aramco, but we do have representation with us from Saudi Aramco who are happy to answer any questions you may have. So we'll pause for a moment, and if you have a question, please type it into the questions box. And while we give you a moment on that, if you've enjoyed today's webinar, you may also be interested in ICME's biannual conference on advances in process automation and digitalization. Our next advances conference takes place in October next year. Keep an eye on the ICME website for more details. Okay, we have no questions, so we've reached that point that everybody's been waiting for. It's time to reveal the winner. So before we do that, let me thank all of our presenters today uh, for sharing more details about their work. I'm sure you'll agree, some really uh, encouraging, very different projects on show. So we'll start with our highly commended entries, and they are from Saudi Aramco, and the joint entry from CPFD Software and Thermochem Recovery International. So well done to everyone associated with those entries. But now to announce the winner, I'd like to hand back over to Aviva's David Bleakley, who will be tasked with that big responsibility. We will just need you to unmute yourself, David, before we. Uh, make the announcement. There we go. I was blocked. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to announce that the winner of the iChemi Process Automation and Digitalization Award for 2020, sponsored by Aviva, 
is GSK. OK, so well, congratulations, congratulations to GSK. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Tobias, if we can get you back on the line, how does it feel to be an ICME Award winner? Yes! <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you very much. This is, yeah. Oh, right. thank you. <laughs> you sound very happy. Are you not expecting to yes, be a winner? Sorry. <laughs> Oh, thank you well, very much. Is there much. anybody else you'd like to thank before we wrap up? No, yeah, I'd like to, like to thank the finalists. I'd like to thank Aviva again for the judging and obviously for sponsoring this award as well. Um, and just, yeah, all, all the team I work with as well to help make it possible and obviously the company because it wouldn't have been possible without them either. So, no, thank you, GSK, as well. So, well, look, thank you Thank very much. you and thank you for that presentation. So, well done, uh, Tobias, and well done to everybody at GSK. And a big thank you to everybody that's joined us today and, of course, our sponsor, Aviva. Don't forget, the ICME Awards webinars continue to come thick and fast over the next week or so. They're all free to attend and open to all, so I hope to see you at some more uh, this week or next week. But for now, it's goodbye and congratulations to GSK, winner of the ICME 2020 Process Automation and Digitalization Awards.